then. Chapter 6, Section 4. Why are these defense associations states? It's clear that so-called anarcho-capitalist defense associations meet the criteria of statehood outlined previously. They defend private property and preserve authority relationships. They practice coercion and are hierarchical institutions which govern those under them on behalf of a ruling elite, i.e. those who employ both the governing forces and those they govern. Thus, from an anarchist perspective, these defense associations are most definitely states. What's interesting, however, is that by their own definitions, a very good case can be made that these defense associations, as states in the so-called anarcho-capitalist sense, Capitalist apologists, uh, capitalist apologists usually define a government or state as those who have a monopoly of force and coercion within a given area. Relative to the rest of society, these defense associations would have a monopoly of force and coercion of given piece of property. Thus, even by the so-called anarcho-capitalist's own definition of statehood, these associations would qualify. If we look at Rothbard's definition of statehood, which requires A, the power to tax, and or B, a coerced monopoly of the provision of defense over a given area, so-called anarcho-capitalism runs into trouble pretty quickly. In the first place, the cost of hiring defense associations will be deducted from the wealth created by those who use, but not who own, the property of capitalists and landlords. Let's not forget that a capitalist will only employ a worker or rent out land and housing if they make a profit from doing so. Without the labor of the worker, there'd be nothing to sell and no wages to pay for rent. Thus, a company's or landlord's defense firm will be paid from the revenue gathered from the capitalist power to extract a tribute from those who use but do not own a property. In other words, workers who pay for the agencies that enforce their employer's authority over them via the wage system and rent is nothing more than taxation, but in a more insidious form. In the second, under capitalism, most people spend a large part of their day on other people's property. That is, they work for capitalists and or live in rented accommodation. Hence, if property owners select a defense association to protect their factories, farms, rental housing, etc., their employees and tenants will view it as a coerced monopoly of the provision of defense over a given area. For certainly the employees and tenants will not be able to hire their own defense companies to expropriate the capitalists and landlords. So from the standpoint of the employees and tenants, the owners do have a monopoly of defense over the area in question. Of course, the so-called anarcho-capitalists will argue that the tenants and workers consent to all the rules and conditions of a contract when they sign it, and so the property owner's monopoly is not coerced. However, the consent argument is so weak in conditions of inequality as to be useless. See chapter 2, section 4, chapter 3, section 1 for examples on this that we've already covered. And moreover, it can and has been used to justify the state. In other words, consent in and of itself does not ensure that a given regime is not statist. See chapter 2, section 3 for where we've covered this. So an argument along these lines is deeply flawed and can be used to justify regimes which are little better than industrial feudalism. Company towns, for example, an institution which right libertarianism has no problem with. Even the general libertarian law code could be considered a monopoly of government over a particular area. Particularly if ordinary people have no real means of affecting the law code, either because it's market-driven and is so is money-determined, or because it will be natural law and so unchangeable by mere mortals. In other words... If the state arrogates to itself a monopoly of force of ultimate decision-making power over a given area uh, or territorial area, Rothbard, Ethics of Liberty, page 170, then it's pretty clear that the property owner shares this power. The owner is, after all, the ultimate decision-making power in their workplace or on their land. If the boss takes a dislike to you, for example, you don't follow their orders, then you get fired. If you cannot get a job or rent the land without agreeing to certain conditions, such as not joining a union or subscribing to the defense firm approved by your employer, then you either sign the contract or look for something else. Of course, Rothbard fails to note that the bosses have this monopoly of power and is instead referring to prohibiting the voluntary purchase and sale of defense and judicial services. Uh, services. Page 171 on that one. But just as surely as the law of contract allows the banning of unions from a property, it can just as surely ban the sale and purchase of defense and judicial services. 
It could be argued that market forces would stop this from happening, but it's unlikely as bosses usually have the advantage on labor market and workers have to compromise to get a job. See chapter 10, section 2 on why that's the case. After all, in company towns, only company money was legal tender and company policy the only law and, uh, and company police the only law enforcers. Therefore, it's obvious that the so-called anarcho-capitalist system meets the Weberian criteria of a monopoly to enforce its uh, certain rules in a given area of land, as well as meeting their own criteria of monopoly to enforce certain rules in a given area. The general libertarian law code is a monopoly, and property owners determine the rules that apply to their property. Moreover, if the rules that property owners enforce are subject to rules contained in the monopolistic general libertarian law code, for example, that they cannot ban the sale and purchase of certain products, such as defense on their own territory, then so-called anarcho-capitalism definitely meets the Weberian definition of the state, as described by Ayn Rand even as an institution that holds the exclusive power to enforce certain rules of conduct in a given geographical area. Capitalism, the unknown ideal, page 239, as its law code overrides the de desires of property owners to do what they like on their property. Therefore, no matter how you look at it, so-called anarcho-capitalism and its defense market promotes a monopoly of ultimate decision-making power over a given territorial area. It's obvious that for anarchists, the anarcho-capitalist system is a state system. As we note, a reasonable case can be made for it also being a state in so-called anarcho-capitalist theory as well. So in effect, so-called anarcho-capitalism has a different sort of state, one in which bosses hire and fire the policemen. As Peter Sabatini notes in Libertarianism, Bogus Anarchy, within libertarianism, Rothbard represents a minority perspective that actually argues for the total elimination of the state. However, Rothbard's claim as an anarchist is quickly voided when it's shown that he only wants, to end to the, uh, wants an end to the public state. In its place, he allows countless private states, with each person supplying their own police force, army, and law, or else purchasing these services from capitalist vendors. Rothbard sees nothing at all wrong with the amassing of wealth. Therefore, those with more capital will inevitably have greater coercive, co coercive force at their disposal, just as they do now. Far from wanting to abolish the state, then so-called anarcho-capitalists only desire to privatize it to make it solely accountable to capitalist wealth. Their companies perform the same services as the state for the same people in the same manner. However, there's only one slight difference. Property owners would be able to select between competing companies for their services. Because such companies are employed by the boss, they would be used to reinforce the totalitarian nature of capitalist firms by ensuring that the police and law they enforce are not even slightly accountable to ordinary people. Looking beyond defense association to the defense markets itself, as we discussed and argued about in the last section, this will become a cartel and so become some kind of public state. The very nature of the private state, its need to cooperate with others in the same industry, push it towards a monopoly network of firms and so a monopoly of force over a given area. Given the assumptions used to defend so-called anarcho-capitalism, its system of private statism will de uh, develop into public statism, a state run by managers accountable only to shareholding elites. To quote Peter Marshall again, the so-called anarcho-capitalists claim that all would benefit from a free exchange on the market. It is by no means certain. Any unfettered market system would most likely sponsor a reversion to an unequal society with defense associations perpetuating exploitation and privilege, demanding the impossible, page 565. History and current practice prove this point. In short, so-called anarcho-capitalists are not anarchists at all. They are just capitalists who desire to see private states develop, states which are strictly accountable to their paymasters without even the sham of democracy we have today. Hence, a far better name for so-called anarcho-capitalism would be private state capitalism. At least that way we get a fairer idea of what they're trying to sell us. As Bob Black writes in The Libertarian as Conservative, quote, To my mind, a right-wing anarchist is just a minarchist who'd abolish the state to his own satisfaction by calling it something else. They don't denounce what the state does, they just object to who's doing it.